Last week, uh, Pastor Allen talked about sides and the sides you're on. And the side that you uh, pick, it, it doesn't really matter because the only side that matters is his side. And that's what he was sharing with you last week. And so when you talk about picking sides, his side's the one that counts. And when his side counts, when we look at that, then we would say, if I'm choosing his side, then I'm choosing to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And if I'm a follower of, follower of Jesus then that makes me a Christian in today's world. And if I'm a Christian, that puts us all on the same team. Say team. Let's try that again. We, I do like interaction. Say team. team. All right, good. So what happens is we're on the same team. We're as Christians. That calls us us, all right? We're not just I or me. We are us. So I'm going to talk to you. I want to have a dialogue this morning with you about the culture of us. Now say us. You guys are good. I'm telling you. You guys are getting it. This is good. Um, now, culture is one of these things that's hard to define. Now, I, I don't know about you, but my, my family, we love Mexican food, right? And in a lot of towns, and here in Sioux Falls, there's Mexican food, restaurants. There's a lot of different ones. But there's always that one that you kind of go back to over and over again. You know, a lot of things speak to why you go back to that same place over and over again. It could be the taste of the food. It could be the atmosphere of the room that you sit in. It could be the server and how they come and serve you. It's that kind of service that they give you. You love it. You like the price and you like the taste. All these things actually speak to the culture of that restaurant. And that culture is what draws you back over and over again. And so when we look at culture, it does kind of sometimes hard to put our finger on it or our, our mind around because it does have intangibles. But if we could put it this way, uh, culture is in every aspect of our lives. There's a culture in your home. Your home has a specific culture. Uh, your business place that you work at or the business that you own, it has a specific culture. The church here has a specific culture. And the culture of this church attracts you. That's why you keep coming back. It's The culture is different in every church, in every home, in every business. Now, some cultures can be quite toxic, but culture is huge. A another way that you can put this, and I, I want you to write this down if you are somebody that likes to take notes, but I want you to write this down. Culture is more powerful than vision. Culture is more powerful than vision. And here's why that is. Because you can have vision, okay? Vision is good. You might have a vision for your family. You're like, I don't have that. You walk into your house, you have one of those signs that says, our family, we are to laugh often, you know, all those kind of things, right? You know, that's kind of the culture that you've wrote on the wall that you hopefully have in your home. You might have a, a vision for your business, Okay, you might have a vision for your church and you can put it on the wall and you can write it all down and that's wonderful. But if you don't behave the same way that those words declare, then it doesn't matter, does it? It's just a bunch of words. See, culture is behavior. That's why culture is more powerful than vision. It's how we behave. We can say that we're a Christian, right? We're on God's team, right? We can say all those things, but guess what? If we don't behave that way, it's just words, isn't it? Anybody ever met a hypocritical Christian? Just two of us, apparently. Really? You're all hypocrites. No, think about it, though. I mean, I've met hypocritical Christians. You've met hypocritical Christians. We've met a lot of people that say a lot of things, but they never behave that way, right? We've all done that. So that's why the culture of us is crucial, the culture of us as Christians. Another way that you can put culture is the way we do things here. That's another way to put culture. It's the way we do things here. It's the way you do things in your home, the way you do things in your business, it's the way we do things at church. And you're again attracted to that over and over again. Now, we can talk a lot of components of culture, but there's one area that I really want to dial into this morning about culture. And my prayer for you today is that you'll take a journey of discovery and saying, God, what's the culture that you want in my home? What's the culture that you want in my business? What's the culture that you want me to bring to the table in my job? What's that culture that you want me to help build in this church? What does that culture look like? One of the components that I want to stress that I think that you need to make sure is incorporated into your culture is authentic celebration. Say authentic celebration. Celebration. 
You guys really lived up to that word. It was good, okay? <laughs> See, authentic celebration is huge for us because as Christians, here's what I see a lot in today's world. I think people know definitely what we're against, don't they? I think things should change, and I think the world should know more about what we're for than what we're against. Let me say that again. I think it's time that we change and we start living and behaving a certain way that the world knows more about what we're for than what we're against. Look at your neighbor say, I'm going to celebrate. We're going to do this again. Look at your neighbor say, I'm going to celebrate. There we go. We're getting it. Now look to the other person on the other side of you and say, I'm sorry you weren't my first choice. I'm going to celebrate. Authentic celebration is huge. Celebration is a key word that I think we've got to have in our culture of us as Christians. It should be something that's in our culture, in our home, and in our business, and in our church. See, celebration is intentional. Celebration is a choice. You have to choose to do that. Now, there's a book that I want to reference. Uh, Robert Foster wrote this book called The Celebration of Discipline. Uh, I, I've studied this book. This book, I've taught on it many times. But this book was huge in my life. And he speaks to the idea of the celebration of discipline. And up until this point, a lot of people struggled with celebration and discipline kind of coinciding. These words don't come together because spiritual disciplines look like this for us. They're kind of the idea that, you know what, if I pray, if I read my Bible, if I, if I worship, these are all spiritual disciplines. But look at what it says that Robert Foster said in his book. Celebration is central to all spiritual disciplines. Without a joyful spirit of festivity, the disciplines become dull, death-breathing tools in the hands of modern Pharisees. Wow. When you don't celebrate, you're a Pharisee. When you don't live in a celebratory nature and culture and behavior, then you can be easily come a Pharisee, a hypocritical Christian, a one who points out, hey, you're in sin. Hey, you've got this wrong. Hey, you're doing that wrong. Anybody ever experienced that before? And we lose some things when we aren't celebrating properly, when we're not looking at everything in a broader context of what God wants to do in our life. And celebration is a true spiritual discipline. And I'm building this in my heart. I'm building this in our church. I'm building this in my family. I want to build this more. I want to celebrate more because I'm tired of the world knowing what Christians are against. I want them to start knowing what we're for. Amen? That's what we need to be about. We need to be celebratory. We need to celebrate because if we're not, we're becoming dead judgmental Pharisees when we don't celebrate. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 3. If you don't have that there, uh, it's going to be on the screen here. Zephaniah 3 verse 17 says this. We're just going to be in Zephaniah here just for a minute. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. That is a celebratory God. That is the God who celebrates over you. Say, God, God. Celebrates, celebrates over me. Man, doesn't that feel amazing? That's the character of our God. That's the behavior of our God. He celebrates over you. He celebrates over me. That is the character of God. It is not this. I'm just another day at church. I'm going to get up on a snowy Sunday and go to church. Are you kidding me? That's not God. See, my wife and I, we, people that are like that, and if you're sitting next to one, do not look at them right now. It would be very awkward, okay? But my wife and I, we call these people fun sponges. If you're a fun sponge, you need to grab a hold of this message today, and you need to start living celebratory. Because I'm telling you, God is sick of fun sponges in his church. Hello? You need to start celebrating. You need to start living that way. This is the character of our God. He sings over you. He celebrates over you. He loves you. That's the character of our God that we need to begin to reflect. You know, when we look at scripture, 
uh, Jesus starts a lot of parables with this statement. The kingdom of heaven is like. He starts these, a lot of statements, parables, stories that he's sharing with people. He says the kingdom of heaven is like. Or the kingdom of heaven may be compared to is what he says. Now, this is very cool. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. This is awesome. This is what Jesus is sharing. He says, and again, Jesus spoke to them. This is verse 1 of 22. And Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. In other words, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a party. That's awesome. Say party. It's okay to party in church. It's okay to have a party heart. It's okay to have something that says, you know what? My God says that the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a party. That's awesome. Again, if you're a fun sponge this morning, you need to grab a hold of this message. Because this is what Jesus said. The son of God said the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a party. Well, I've been to some weddings. They weren't that fun. <laughs> We've got to understand that reflecting the celebratory nature of God it is amazing because when we look throughout scripture, God does this over and over again. He actually describes the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a banquet, a wedding. These are celebratory events. How many have been married? Okay, right? That day was nice, right? Maybe some of the days following, maybe were a little rough. But that day was fun. It was a great day. It was a celebratory day. You go to a banquet, there's food. Sorry if you're fasting. I've been rubbing into Pastor Allen this whole weekend. We're out to eat, and he's eating a salad, and I'm just going, oh, look at these juicy nachos. These are awesome. <laughs> he just called me the devil. <clears throat> but this is what God is about. It says that the kingdom of heaven is like a party. It's like a wedding feast. It's like a banquet. This is what heaven is like. And yet we walk around in the world today telling everybody what we're against. Well, pastor, you know, you should be able to have the attitude that we are supposed to point out sin. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. But you know what I've learned is that people don't want to be around fun sponges. They don't want about people that are pointing out all the wrong and everybody else. And what I've learned is that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But what I do know is that when I am celebrating and I am living a celebratory life, people want to know the Jesus I know. And it's amazing what God will do with that and the bridges that he will build with that. See, we need to understand that this authenticity and celebrating does something for us. See, a lot of us get this way, you know? <sighs> I don't make enough money and I just don't make enough at my job and my job is horrible and I don't make enough. You know, my spouse, oh my gosh, they are just driving me crazy. They leave their underwear on the floor all the time. I just, they're driving me nuts, right? You know, I don't, I just, I can't stand this. You know, we get in this fun sponge mode, right? And we start complaining about all kinds of stuff. What happens if instead of we stop complaining about the money we make, we start celebrating the money we do have? What would happen? What if we stopped complaining about the job or, or uh, the, the raise we didn't get or the promotion we didn't get and we start celebrating the job we do have? What would happen if we stopped complaining and being petty about the little things in our marriage and in our relationship and started celebrating the things that brought you together? What if we started celebrating those things? Because write this one down because you need to get this one, okay? You get what you celebrate, you get what you celebrate. You want something to change? You want to make some more money? Celebrate the money you do have. You want a promotion at your job? Celebrate the job you do have. You want something to happen in your marriage? Celebrate the marriage you have. You want something to change? Celebrate what you want. My kids don't listen to me. Celebrate when they do something right. It's amazing what can shift and change. You want something to happen, we get what we celebrate. See, God celebrates over you. 
He wants you to flourish. And this is what God wants for us to do in our lives. If we're going to celebrate something, I promise you, you're going to get more of what you celebrate. An example of that is, is just, you know, when you celebrate somebody coming to know Jesus, more people find Jesus. I'm telling you, it's amazing. When you start celebrating a life that has changed because they encountered the power and the presence of God, when you celebrate that, more of that happens. But if you want something to change in your job and your home and with your kids and with your marriage, with your finances, celebrate what you've got. And you will see what God will do with that. See, when we celebrate, it connects us to God. It draws us into connection with him. And when we are worshiping this morning, when you're worshiping, that is a celebratory moment that draws you into connection with God. How many are thankful for your worship team? Really? Come on. You guys got an awesome worship team. Come on. They're great people, all right? They're leading you in celebrating what God's done for us. That he's given his life for us. That he has drawn us to him. That he loves us as we come to him. He loves us as we are. And he moves in our life and he operates in our life. This is what we're celebrating. And when we come into worship, it causes us to find this amazing amount of rest. And we celebrate. It is cool when that happens, when we do it with all of our hearts. It recalibrates us when we come into worship. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians 4, 4, look at this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. <laughs> I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Wow. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, underline this part, and thank him for all he has done. That is key. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. If you are struggling and you're in the battle of a lifetime right now, if you find yourself in a valley moment where it seems like everything is dark and everything is going wrong, I'm telling you, if you will come and you will lift up the name of God and you will worship him and you will bow down to him and say, God, you are worthy of praise even in the midst of my storm, even as, as the worship team was talking at the end of the service, you know, at the end of worship about how, you know, it is well with my soul, even though everything is gone. When you begin to worship God, it recalibrates you. It causes you to rest in his presence. It causes you you to be able to take a breath. It causes you to have a moment of sabbatical. It causes you to be able to let go of the stress and the strife and the anger and the frustration that's going on inside of you when you worship him. And why does that matter? Because when you celebrate God, it naturally causes peace and rest to come upon you. What does that celebration look like? The key is what I told you to underline. It all comes down, it all hinges on Thanking God for all he has done. That's what it comes to. It's thanking him for what he's done. I'm celebratory in nature. I'm celebratory because I know that I don't deserve it, but God saved me. He set me free. He redeemed me from my past, and I have a new step. I have a new dance. I have a new skip. It's great. And we need to start living that way as Christians. The culture of us needs to be about living a celebratory life in all that God has done. Well, I don't have anything to celebrate because I, I don't know what God's done. Okay, Just, here we go, ready? Everybody take a breath, deep breath. Let it out. That's something to celebrate for. You have breath in your body. Now hand the person next to you a mint. <laughs> we have breath in our body. And because of that, that's one thing to celebrate. Right now, you have something to celebrate over, but have we ever taken the time to examine our life and to look at what we can celebrate? See, this all hinges on us thanking God for what he's done. And the foundation, I want you to write this down, the foundation of joy 
is gratitude. The foundation of joy is gratitude. Being grateful. God, I'm grateful for what I have. I'm grateful for the dollar in my pocket. I'm grateful for the job that I have. Not my boss, but the job. Right? I'm thankful because I have kids. I'm thankful because I have a spouse. I'm thankful. Find something to be thankful about because you get what you celebrate. Celebrate it. See, the foundation of joy is gratitude and the foundation of celebration is joy. The foundation of celebration is joy. It's having the joy of the Lord in your heart. It's having the joy of the Lord in you, moving through you, causing you to lift your head up, to shine onto the Lord, to look at him and say, God, I know you've given me something today. I know you've put breath in my body. Amen? It's a struggle to celebrate at times. It's a struggle. When you're in your valley, when you're struggling, when you're fighting, it is hard for you to have joy. It's hard for you because the storm of life is around you. And you think, what, what's going to happen to me? And where am I going to go? And how's this going to work out? If you'll begin to look for the smallest thing to be thankful for, you watch that you'll begin to recalibrate. When you come to the Lord and you say, God, I'm thankful for the breath in my body, or I'm thankful that I have another day with my family. I'm thankful that I have the ability to go to work, or I'm thankful when you begin to have gratitude, just find the smallest thing to be grateful for, and you'll begin to see this shift in your heart. See, what happens is when we come to the Lord and worship and we're grateful, we're filled with joy, and when we're filled with joy, what happens is, is it shifts and recalibrates us, causes us to rest in him, causes us to forget about the worry and the pain. A friend of mine, he's a pastor friend of mine, uh, his name's Brian Jarrett, he said this, the very act of celebration causes us to be anchored in God. The very act of celebration causes us to be anchored in God. See, the real test comes. The real culture is tested. Our real behavior is tested when we can celebrate and worship God even in the tragedy of life. And I'll tell you, in that is where you find your true anchor point. In that is where you are not swayed. In that is where you find peace. In that is where you can find joy. Because listen, joy is different than happiness. Happiness is your circumstances and how they play into your life. Joy is not based on circumstance. Joy is found in an anchoring in God Almighty because he's God on his throne, no matter what life throws at you. That's what it comes down to. Our circumstances, some of you need to hear this today. Our circumstances aren't eternal. Our circumstances are not eternal. The storm raging around you in life right now is not eternal. It's not going to last forever. So don't behave as it though it's going to last forever. Change that behavior. Find the joy. Find something to be grateful for. Find that gratitude. Find that moment to be thankful to God. So in closing, this is what I want to do. I want us to begin to take inventory right now of our life. I want us to begin to process where we are and who we are and what do we need to change because the culture, it's time that the church today begins to shift and stop saying what we're against and start saying what we're for. But that starts with every one of us individually finding great gratitude in God and saying, I'm grateful for the breath that I have. I'm grateful because my joy is found and anchored in God and not in my circumstances.